You may be seated. Please pray with me. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The New Testament reading for today is from the book of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That one leper seemed pretty grateful, didn't he? He was also pretty glad for having been cured. But there's something that happens, and I want to talk about the fact that there is a difference, I think, between being glad and being grateful. You know, and joy and happiness. That's what we want to experience in so much of life. You know, we look to food as more than nourishing to us. We want to go feel good. We want to enjoy the experience. You know, as a child, man, you give a child a toy they've been wanting to get, boy, I'd, my eyes would light up. I'd be awful glad. But my mom would be there, and she'd start to teach me how to be grateful. You know, at Christmas, you open up that present, and my mom will go, so what do you say? Then I'd run over to the aunt or uncle who had given it, give him a hug and say, thank you. So glad was what happened in me. But gratitude is a response to being glad, to be happy, or to experience joy. And as we get older, the toys, let's face it, us guys have toys, all right? We still like toys. But as we get older, all of us begin to appreciate things that aren't as tangible, the nice things that someone does to you, does for you, the um, encouragement they give to you, the love they show, as well as the times when they might forgive you for what you've done or not done. And because we grow to appreciate a growing breadth and width of the ways that we can be blessed. Now, as I mentioned, there's a bit of a difference between being glad and being grateful. And I chose those two words because two words that begin with G are a whole lot more fun than saying happy and grateful. You know, but you can think, whenever I say glad, you can think joy, uh, happiness, that positive experience that gets created within us. There are these things, that, and it's invaluable to experience joy. It's in, invaluable to experience things that make us glad. But sometimes we begin to appreciate the source of those blessings, and that's gratitude. Gratitude is our being glad, our being grateful for where those blessings have come from. Gratitude's inner. Gratitude is something that's within us. But it brings about an outward, at least an outlook, and hopefully the opportunity that we take advantage of to express gratitude to God for his blessings, to other people for the ways they've blessed us. Being glad, experiencing joy and happiness 
can so often and should almost always, I can't think of an exception, result in gratitude. You, you stare at an amazing sunrise, and your heart just kind of enters a different place. And we ought to soak that in. We need to make more time for that sort of thing. But also a gratitude for the one who created us, for our health, our, the opportunity to be there in that place and time for the God who put the stars in their orbits. We can have inner gladness and joy, but even the dictionary points out that gratitude is about more than us. Gratitude is our seeing beyond its effect on ourselves, being grateful for the source of the blessing. Now, in today's passage that uh, Shannon read, there's 10 people that were made very glad. These lepers, all 10 of them, you know, were glad. But it appears that only one is grateful. <laughs> only one thanks Jesus. You know, this disfiguring disease separated them from everything, and almost from life, and in, even from life, when it might eventually kill them through an infection. They're separated from their family, from their friends, from public places, let alone religious events. Because if they were to touch someone else, that person would be treated as unclean as that leper themselves until they have been gone through a ritual purification. But Jesus sees these lepers as something different than everyone else around them. And because of that, he does for them what only God can do. But... Only one of the lepers demonstrates gratitude. Only one leper was appreciative of the source of this healing that they probably had no hope for. Well, Jesus, if we look back, beginning of this passage, it says he was on his way to Jerusalem. A couple chapters before this, he says he was going on his way to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed and hand over to man and be, you know, be killed, but also raised from the dead. And his disciples try to talk him out of going. But he's on his way to Jerusalem to offer himself. And on the way, he sees some other people that have a need. And before our days of interstates where they might just plow through the middle of nowhere, the roads and the trails back in that day would kind of go from village to village. And so when Jesus was traveling, they traveled through that village. You might remember situations where he runs into blind people, where he ran into Zacchaeus as he's going through these villages. And as he's passing through this village, it says at the entrance to the village, meaning that outside of the village, not in the village, outside of the village, which is where the lepers needed to stay, away from people, they see Jesus. And when you see Jesus, some things tend to happen, don't they? <laughs> and they shout because evidently they had heard about this Jesus. They shout, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When all so often in their life, they would have to cry out, unclean, unclean. Instead, seeing Jesus, they cry out for mercy. Now, it also says, keeping their distance, didn't it? They understood that they were unclean, but they also understood there's something special here in Jesus. Now, one of the things that strikes me is he's traveling in the region between Samaria and Judea. He is in no man's land because the Samaritans and the uh, Jews, they didn't get along well. They told bad things about each other. But Jesus is there anyways. And what he is going to do 
is written as a response to seeing them. Seeing these lepers. Now, most people, if they saw the lepers, they'd look the other way. One reason was they'd have growing disfigurements as infections and wounds on their body. We read, and you can Google the pictures of people missing noses and ears and fingers and great wounds upon themselves. People would also look away from lepers because you know they're going to be asking you for something. You know they're going to be begging something for you because they depended upon the generosity of others. But instead of disgust, instead of avoiding an obligation or a guilt feeling that he ought to help, Jesus sees something in these lepers. And seeing them, he needs to help. It says, when Jesus saw them, now you remember, they saw Jesus. Jesus sees them back now. It says, go and show yourself to the priests. This is what a leper would do if they were cured of the disease. They would have to go to the priests. Where are the priests? The priests are in Jerusalem, the same place he's heading. They would have to go to the priest where the priest would determine whether or not the leprosy has gone, whether or not that person is once again clean and no longer unclean, no longer contagious, as well as once again being a person who can gather in the presence of others, let alone in the temple to worship God. In reality, the priest would kind of say, you've been resurrected. You can once again live. Now, it's interesting to note here, and it's always kind of struck me as kind of interesting that it doesn't say, be healed, and all of a sudden all their wounds are healed, and they got fresh pink, baby fresh skin, and then he tells them to go see the priests. He says, go see the priests. And it says, as they went, they were healed. They had to take a step of faith. They had to begin to do what Jesus told them to do, even though they might not yet have seen reason to believe it. But verse 14 says, as they went, as they went, as they were going, they were made clean. They were not yet cured until they began to go. They had, enough, they had to have enough faith in Jesus to take that first step and then the next step. They had to have enough faith to begin to do that, not knowing how it was all going to end out. End up, you know, hey, how can I show up with a priest? They're going to be mad at me for even getting close. But they had to take that step because Jesus said, do this. Go see the priest. And as they went, not as they stood there, not as they waited for the healing, not as they made excuses, but as they actually began to do what Jesus called for them to do, they were made clean. And then here's the amazing part. One of them, one of them, seeing that they were healed, says, turn back, praising God out loud. One of them saw that not only were they glad they were healed, but they were in awe, in appreciation of the one who had made it possible. That one was experiencing gratitude. He was not only glad and happy and rejoicing about his situation, he was rejoicing out loud what God had done for him. And he goes back. He turns away from the next step and takes a pause to be with Jesus. He lays himself, humbles himself before Jesus, thanking him, so grateful. Rather than staying away from Jesus like he had a moment ago with the other lepers, they saw Jesus, they called out to him, but they kept their distance, it said. 
He now approaches Jesus because he can. He's been made clean. Rather than continuing to go to the priest, he comes back. Rather than just rejoicing for, of his changed circumstance, he was grateful for the one who made that possible. And then the Gospel of Luke has another surprise for us. It may sound a little familiar to our ears, but it would have blown the minds of a lot of Jewish people in Jesus' day. Because we think, wow, this one leper... He's the good guy. He's the hero of the story, isn't he? He is. He truly is. But just like the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus messes with their minds. It says that rather than being a good Jewish boy raised in a good family who has always done the right thing, it says he's a Samaritan, the one despised by the Jews. A Samaritan is the one praising God. A Samaritan is the one that prostrates himself before Jesus. A Samaritan is held up as the example for us. Now, we obviously know that Jesus noticed that only one of them came back. Jesus, it's on his lips where he says, where are the other nine? None of them returned and praised God except for, Jesus' words, not mine, except for this foreigner. Undoubtedly, they were all very happy, but only one was grateful. Because great gratitude is something that Jesus teaches over and over again, not just because it's polite, but because it changes our hearts and our lives. Something I wasn't planning to say, but it rings in my mind all the time, is um, during the Protestant Reformation, you had the, the Ten Commandments, the law. And the question was, if we are for, freely forgiven, if we're forgiven by grace through faith, and not of anything we've done or not done, what good are the Ten Commandments? It's a good question, isn't it? And they came up with a couple answers. One was, it shows how a freely forgiven people ought to live. You know, if we're forgiven, this is a road map. This shows us how we ought to live. But why should we, why should we do that? And the answer that came up was, in grateful response for what God has done that our gratitude for what God has done results in our living differently. That it's not guilt that drives us to live as God calls for us to live, but gratitude to live as God calls for us to live. One of the amazing parables that Jesus, Jesus tells is about this guy who owes the ruler a lot of money. And the ruler sends out the people to go drag his fanny on in. And he says, pay up now. He says, I can't. And the king goes, all right, well, throw him and his whole family into jail until they can pay that bill. And the man begs. And the ruler says, I'll tell you what. I'll just forgive your debt. All of it. You don't have to pay it back. But it turns out, as that man is headed home, he runs across someone who owes him a far smaller sum of money. And he says, pay me up. Oh, you can't pay me up? You're going to jail until you can pay me back. Well, some of the ruler's servants had grown aware that this was going on. And they tell the king. And the king is upset because the first man had been forgiven so much, but he didn't dare to forgive someone else. Because gratitude is something that Jesus shows us, it is contagious and a gift to others, and it makes a difference 
because gratitude shapes our life and shapes our heart. And you know what? Life is full of a lot of hard things. Things can be awful dark. You know, we all know people in those situations right now. And you may have been there yourself. Because gratitude sometimes takes a moment to think about it. I love that uh, Shannon brought up, you know, was it three what things? Three good things. As you think of three good things, it shines a light on the other things in our lives. It doesn't make them go away, but it changes how we experience it. And as we become grateful for those three good things, it changes it even further. It changes our life. It changes the way we relate to others. Because God's heart and desire for us is to be grateful. To be grateful in our relationships with him, that we would live for him out of gratitude, not guilt. That we would live with others, forgiving as we have been forgiven, out of gratitude, not obligation. And I've experienced that when I take a time to think about the things for which I can be glad, the good things, and let myself become grateful for them, it changes my heart. Things may be hard, but where there was only darkness, there may be a little nightlight, <laughs> which allow me to put one foot forward, not knowing where the next goes, until I take the first step. When I'm grateful for what I have, I'm generous with others. When I'm grateful that God has forgiven me, I can forgive others. And I believe that we sell our faith far too short when we seek gladness, joy, and happiness. We're not looking for enough if that's what we settle for. Because God offers us far more. He longs to bring us to gratitude and thanksgiving. Because the wonderful thing, the really amazing thing about gratitude is, you know, the things that bring us joy and happiness are good, and we need those. But when we become grateful for them, and it provokes us into acting differently in our relationship with God and with one another. It's not that we give away that happiness. It's that we multiply it. <laughs> multiply it not just for the people that we are gracious towards, but that itself, that experience of being gracious towards others is like a fan upon the flame of the faith in our life. Because gratitude grows the gift rather than giving away. We end up with more rather than less because gratefulness looks beyond ourselves. It recognizes that you know, God and other people are in there with us and for us. And it is a contagious gladness that is given to us and we give to others because gratitude feeds us because when we're grateful, we feed others only to discover that as we have done so, we receive something obtainable no other way that we deeply need. Do you dare to say amen to live that? Amen.